Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Patricia Kranz, the Executive Director of the Overseas Press Club. And um, we are delighted today to have Alex Perry, the winner of the Ed Cunningham Award, um, discuss his article from Outside Magazine, The Last Days of John Al Alan Chow, uh, with Megan Stack, who is a longtime a journalist, author, longtime foreign correspondent. Um, Alex, uh, has worked for Time Magazine and has written um, The Good Mothers, the story of the women who took on the world's most powerful mafia. And Megan um, has two books, Women's Work, and then Every Man in This Village is a Liar. So um, I will now turn it over to Megan. Thank you. Hello, good morning, or good afternoon, rather. Um, so I, I don't want to waste any time because there's there's so much to talk about with Alex in this story, which is um, just an amazing piece of narrative journalism about an incredibly interesting subject. So um, let's just jump into it. Alex, um, can we just orient people a little bit? Would you just kind of tell us the story of John Allen Chow? who was um, only 26 when he died and he was very far from home. Can you just tell people so they kind of click into what we're talking about here? Uh, where did he come from and, and how did he die? John was from uh, Vancouver in Washington State. Um, you may remember him from a, a sort of flurry of headlines um, nearly two years ago now. Um, man killed by Stone Age tribe on remote island, basically. Um, John was a Christian missionary who was trying to kind of achieve the Mount Everest of missionary work, uh, which is to contact the Sentinelese who live on a remote island, uh, two or three hours flight from anywhere off India. Um, and who have a history of repelling violently anybody who tries to contact them, going back hundreds of years, if, if not thousands of years, they're mentioned by Potelemy and Marco Polo as, do not stop on these islands or you will be killed. So in, in a way they are, they are, I mean, they are kind of generally considered to be the most isolated people on earth. And, and for that reason, they are kind of the ultimate goal. If you are the kind of guy who sees themselves uh, walking alone into the jungle to to meet the uncontacted tribe and that's that's what John was trying to do is it in fact it had been his life's mission for well over a decade by the time he died um, do you remember hearing about his death when the news broke yeah I, I did and I, I without even reading the stories I knew exactly where he was trying to go. I'd, I'd, I'd been obsessed with these islands myself as a journalist uh, for well over a decade, you know, from 2002 to 2006, I was based in India. One of the first people I, I met there was an anthropologist who told me about these islands and, and this extraordinary group of, of tribes who lived there. Essentially, they're, um, there are five groups on the islands. The islands, there's about 800 islands, only 30 of them are inhabited. Five of them are inhabited by black African tribes. They are descendants of the first people who ever walked out of Africa, walked through the Middle East and Europe. There was a chain or there was a mountain range that used to connect Burma to Indonesia. 10,000 years ago, the ice caps melted, the seas rose, and these little, this mountain range was reduced to little dots in the ocean. And these people have been isolated there ever since. Uh, so they're, you know, for anthropologists, they're absolutely extraordinary. These are um, really the first man living as they were 10,000 years ago. If you're religious, they're Adam and Eve, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and they have this, they've had a fascination actually for, for outsiders for centuries. The whole um, subject, the whole, the whole school of social anthropology is partly based on a study of these tribes. Um, but yes, for, 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 for Christian missionaries, they've been um, the gold standard. Now, when Mr. Chow died, um, what kind of coverage did the death get 
it was, I remember quite a sort of a sensationalistic story that, that broke. I think a lot of people will remember at least reading this headline, this young American missionary um, killed with arrows in, uh, in the, you know, somewhere in the Pacific, I think was how yeah. most Americans would, would remember that. What was the coverage like? It was almost universally condemnatory, really. And, and the coverage that he received in, I guess, what we kind of quaintly call the mainstream press these days was, was nothing compared to the actual mainstream press, social media, uh, <laughs> which, was, which was, I mean, pretty horrendous. Um, I mean, hateful, really. He, he was uh, characterized as a sort of Christian supremacist, as a racist, um, as someone who was almost deliberately trying to start a genocide because he might have been carrying uh, pathogens that would infect the tribe. Um, you know, some of these arguments um, have some basis in fact, and, uh, you know, there is a sort of consensus really um, that uncontacted tribes should be allowed to live on their own if they want. I mean, more or less centered around a group called Survival International in London that, that has appointed itself the protector of, of these tribes. But the vitriol and the, well, pure hate was pretty shocking. Considering that John, in, in this whole, you know, uh, imbroglio, John was the only guy that was harmed and he died and his family were in mourning. You know, there was no thought, no, no humanity, no empathy at all, really. And for you, I mean, what do you think was pulling you toward wanting to write this story? Well, I mean, I, to, I've been trying to write this story for, for decades. As I say, I was, I was <laughs> um, interested in these tribes. I've been to the islands back and forth a few times. Uh, I've been kicked off the islands. They're a, a border area in India that so they're highly militarized and very protected. I even had a fight with a policeman in the street at one point. So, you know, I'd, I'd become quite obsessed, but I'd never convinced an editor to run the story on the basis that, you know, as one editor said to me, you know, it's fascinating, but I think this story is 10,000 years old, you know, and we're a newspaper. <laughs> so, um, poor John gave me a kind of the perfect excuse to, to unbundle this sort of vast library of stuff that I'd accumulated over the years. But also, I mean, his story kind of absolutely encapsulated the, the, so many of the sort of currents that, 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 that flow through these islands, the sort of the, the horrible colonial history, the, um, the kind of exoticization of tribes, the displacement of uh, kind of tribe, tribes or people's agency. Um, the, the islands, not only are they home to the tribes, they were, um, there was a jail built on there where the Brits used to incarcerate Indian freedom fighters and torture them and conduct horrible sort of medical experiments on them. There's a horrible history of foreigners showing up on these islands and, and behaving really badly. And so a white man walking into the jungle presents a kind of uniquely unfortunate image. And, and that had been me once, actually. That's what I'd been doing. And I realized actually that not only had John done the same, but, but that sort of connection or the parallels between what I'd been doing and what he'd been doing kind of allowed me to get over the, the natural sort of uh, instinct to condemn his actions and, and to see him much more empathetically and, and, and without judgment. I mean, I did think that was one of the really interesting things that is in this piece, um, is the way that you dealt with your own relationship with these kinds of things, particularly um, on the island itself, uh, but also just with the process of kind of turning things into exotic adventures. Um, I thought that you wrote about both of those, of those aspects um, in a very perceptive way, both about yourself and also about John Allen Chow. Um, I, it was very, very interesting to me um, when you sort of, you, you kind of paint this picture of this, of this young man who is coming from um, a household where there have been different kinds of tensions and problems, a very American story. Um, and 
I got the impression from your piece that the pull for him was not purely religious, um, that there were other things that were going on, that he was also drawn to wilderness. Um, and it, it kind of reminded me of another book, uh, Into the Wild, which also sort of unpacks an ordinary, you know, American young man who is pulled into these kind of improbable wilderness adventures and wants to kind of experience something that nobody else can experience. Um, and that religion sort of came along on top of that in a way. That's the way that I understood from reading your story. And I thought it was very interesting the way that you tied that to your own looking for adventure and looking for the unknown that I think so many um, foreign correspondents can also relate to because there is at the heart of foreign correspondence a lot of these same tensions and these same problematic histories. Right. Um, so talk to me about, about that. Like, what do you think, when you look at yourself and when you look at Mr. Mr. Chow, how do you see this sort of search for the unknown that spans across these different professions? Well, I mean, I, I saw that, you know, John presented himself as, as a kind of consummate outdoorsman, a, a kind of trail bro. You know, he was really active mm -hmm. on Instagram. And what's fascinating by that is that I guess that a lot of people lead kind of Instagram lives where they project an image John was doing that as a, as a cover because he was very deliberately not mentioning his real religious mission. Uh, mm -hmm. But it was also, it was a way to, that Instagram account and John's friends and so on, there was a whole subculture there that I hadn't known about, which was kind of the missionary bros. You know, these guys, I, I guess our depiction of kind of high school Christianity is sort of the squares. But these guys are pretty cool, you know. They yeah. were they were outdoorsy, um, you know, cliff jumping types um, who had faith, um, and that I thought was kind of fascinating. The the parallels you're talking about between what was John was doing and, and what you and I've been doing for years as as foreign correspondents. Um, the deeper I got into the story, the more kind of uncomfortably close and apparent they were. You know, we. I definitely spend many years of my life um, running around, getting into sort of uh, slightly extreme circumstances uh, out of, well, partly out of immaturity. I just, I, you know, I love that kind of adventure and um, going to wild places and meeting strange people with guns. You know, it was, I loved it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't claim any kind of high moral for it. And I, you know, I thought, John was the same, in the same way, you know, when I go to a place like Congo and Somalia, over the years it's become more and more apparent to me how exploitative that process can be. I get what I need and what my magazine needs for a good story, um, but I'm absolutely forbidden to pay the person who's allowing my profession to exist. You know, that's an ethical no-no. Yeah. There's, there's, it is, um, and, and John is in the same way, he's, he's going out there to satisfy the needs and the demands and the compulsions of his faith, but he's not really giving any countenance to the agency or the freedoms of the people that he's approaching. Um, you know, these are, I mean, I try and in the article, yeah, I, I, I put a lot of myself in there, you're right. I put a lot of my own doubts about how I've been spending my life in there. Um, and the striking thing about John is that, well, at least in public, he never had those doubts. You know, he, in his diary, he never, he never second-guessed himself ever. That's um, so he interesting. He experienced a certain amount of terror and fear. You know, there was a point at which he knew that he might well die. But if you're a man of faith, that, you know, he's expecting a miracle, right? He, yeah. he, he you know, so this, he, he, he sees it as another test and he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't rethink, and I thought in a way, actually, towards the end, he doesn't have the maturity to face the humiliation of turning around and going home and telling everybody that it didn't work out. Tell me about the journal. I feel like that is, it's such a part of the piece that you wrote, and it creates such um, a window of insight into the character that you're writing about. Um, how did you get the journal? And... How did you decide how to use it inside the piece? Um, 
And did you take it at face value? Did the journal was, yeah, I mean, the journal's an, an extraordinary document. It, it, it spans the four days after John first leaves and he makes his various forays onto the island and it ends literally as he makes his fatal swim to the island. Um, and it starts off really hyper enthusiastic. You know, he's really pumped. He, he can't wait. He's been waiting for this moment all his life and he's finally setting off. And then it just goes into this really sudden decline. You know, he, he, he moves from jubilation to frustration when uh, the tribe doesn't accept him at first. Then terror, they try and kill him. A kid comes out of nowhere and shoots him yeah. with an arrow. It hits a, it hits a Bible uh, <laughs> that, that he's holding up. Uh, you know, you and I would imagine uh, I imagine our reaction would be close shave. Of course, John thinks he's been saved by God. And, and then the, the night before he dies, he doesn't get a lot of sleep and he's writing a lot. And there's, it's, it's quite tearful. It's very emotional. He says goodbye to friends and family. Um, but as I say, he, he doesn't express doubt. He expresses terror. He, he says he doesn't want to die. He's confronting that that's a very real possibility now. Um, but yeah, I, it, as, as, a, as a sort of, as a trajectory, as a journey, it's, it's the most uh, extraordinary document, incredibly moving. Um, but, and it's really long, you know, so that was a real advantage. We used in outside most of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt like, you know, I needed 10,000 words because, because 1,500, 2,000 of them are John's journal and, and to have his voice coming through, um, again, it, you know, it's an incredible, it's just, it, it's an unbeatable tool to get inside someone's head. You know, I couldn't write that. You know, how did you actually get it? Like, how did you physically get your get access well, to it was, it, That was being passed around Port Blair. It wasn't hard. The police had wow. done a, a transcript, um, which was inaccurate, but they'd mm -hmm. also they'd also scanned the uh, the actual written documents. So I had those pages, and I think uh, I think the New York Times stuck it up on its website or something as well. You know, it was around. It was just that no one had really used it properly. You know, people had taken a quote mm -hmm. here and there. And, you know, not because they were bad journalists, just because they didn't have the space. But, you know, when you've got a decent long form page, you know, 14 pages, right, you can really get into it. That, I, I suddenly, you know, this, this story, were quite, you know, with all the backstory, the colonial story, John's diary, this story required, like, some, some real real estate. Absolutely. I mean, when you started reporting the story, when you got the assignment to do it, um, tell us about your movements. I mean, how did you get access? Where were you able to go? Um, it's a difficult, you know, it's a difficult story to write. It's a difficult thing to figure out how much actual information you could get. Yeah, well, and as I say, the islands are, are, are military, or they're, you know, India is a democracy, but those islands are kind of an exception. They're, I don't think there's democratic representation, but certainly they're run by an appointed governor. There's not, you know, and, and the police there and the, the army and so on are notably unfriendly to journalists. I mean, I, I, I experienced that in the past. So I knew <clears throat> that I had to go in uh, quietly, um, kind of, uh, yeah, I didn't declare myself to anybody. So I stayed in a, in a, in a small backpacker's guest house I worked with um, uh, a guy that I knew on the islands who's supremely good and, and totally connected, but I stayed away from authority because the moment I spoke to any of them, I'd have been kicked off the islands again. And I, I stayed there for, um, I think 10 days, maybe two weeks, something like that. Um, just painstakingly reconstructing John's time on the islands. He'd done four trips there, just going everywhere. And, and trying to work out his process, his mind. But also, I mean, he'd been all over the place. Um, so it was a real kind of detective story. Why did he go here? Why did he go here? A real clue actually was a calendar that he left in the same backpackers hostel that I was staying in. The barman showed it to me one night. 
and it was a calendar that John had made with you know his photographs and they were a record of where he'd been and you know they were some quite odd places to go so you know one was right next to a Jarrowa reserve it's, a, it's another tribe on the island the only reason to go there is to meet the Jarrowa another one was a, a rather a, he, he'd been to two or three villages um, which are the nearest jumping off points to the Sentinel Island. You know, so, so through this and, and, and retracing his steps and, and looking at receipts of other backpacker hostels that he'd been to and stuff like that, I could, I could place him and then I could talk to people in those areas who'd met him and kind of work out his thought process, his planning process, you know, for this expedition. Um, yeah, it was, it was really slow, slow detective work. But I, you know, I love that kind of work, actually. I, I, you yeah. know, I, I can't sleep when I'm on a story like that. Well, it was really interesting to read about the lengths that John went to, Mr. Chow, um, to prepare himself. Because I know as a reader, when I read the, the quick news stories, I guess I, it's sort of, I imagined this almost impulsive decision for this kid who went and got some fishermen to drop him off by the island and just got killed. But that wasn't the case at all. This had been a lifelong ambition. He had done all kinds of things uh, to prepare himself, starting back in the US and the Midwest. Didn't I read, he went, to, uh, uh, some, he went to something in Missouri to get training and advice about how to uh, yeah. convert indigenous tribes i mean i he went through like i would say almost years of preparation right john had been on this mission for about a decade yeah. I mean, of course he rewrote his own story kind of with hindsight so he would trace it back even further to uh, when he went robinson crusoe and right. uh going to hawaii with his with his uh family um but he had a break with his father um, when he was about 17, his father, who was a doctor, uh, got busted mm -hmm. uh, for selling opioids uh, to two undercover DEA agents in large quantities without good reason. Uh, it was a family disgrace. John's two older siblings, a, a brother and sister, had, had followed their father into medicine, and, and John might well have done the same, but at that moment, John took a sharp left turn into climbing a lot of mountains and radical Christianity. And he, around, not long after that, or around about the same time, he did a mission to Mexico, part of his, uh, with his school. And he came back from that with a very simple idea of, of, of you know, what would be the ultimate. And quite quickly zeroed in on, on Sentinel Island. And for 10 years, really, he was, in a sense, preparing for this trip. Uh, physically, a lot of his, you know, his father told me that, that all the hikes he was doing, he always saw as preparation for John to go there. As I say, he'd been to the islands four, three or four times before. Um, he had done missionary work uh, in other areas, but again, it was all kind of prep. Um, you're right, he went to a kind of military boot camp, uh, which is a bizarre place where, where other missionaries would sort of leap out of the woods and threaten you and you had to try and communicate. Um, he'd been to a linguistic school. Um, I think he'd done that twice actually, uh, to try and pick, to try and learn how to pick up a language of which you know not a word and don't understand the grammar. Um, the whole thing, his whole life was directed at this one point at this island. And so, you know, people said, you know, the re after he, the news broke when he died, oh, what a crazy thing to do, that's suicidal. John was the opposite of that. He was meticulous. You know, he was cautious, actually. Um, he did an enormous amount of reading. He, you know, he couldn't possibly have been more prepared. You know, his error, obviously, was never really to imagine how he might appear to people that he was approaching. But in terms of his own prep and his knowledge and his reading, um, he, he dedicated his life to this, yeah. Well, here's a question actually from when I see it, it's popped up a couple times from somebody who's watching um, and it's a good, it sort of segues in. So let's, why don't you address it now? Sure. Somebody is asking, um, would you label John as mentally ill? Hmm. That's a question. Well, no, I wouldn't. I mean, he was, 
not by the u usual definitions. He was, he was absolutely rational. Um, but you're, you, you sort of get into an area of, of, of how do you classify a, a, a fanatic? You know, he was um, absolutely driven and monofocused, um, which is bordering on fanaticism, I suppose. But if, but if he was, but he wasn't mentally unwell. He was perfectly rational. Uh, he moved rationally. He had a purpose and he moved towards it systematically and methodically. Um, you can question that purpose and, you know, a, from a sort of safety point of view or point of view, or, or also from an ethical point of view, should he, should he have been doing that? You know, that's absolutely valid. But to say that he's wrong is not to say that he was crazy. He was, what he was doing was radical for sure, but he wasn't crazy. I mean, I remember reading in your piece, uh, in the journal excerpts that there's this scene where, and I think you just referenced it as well, but it's very, it's very kind of, it, it, there's a there's a pathos to it because it, he's sort of writing over and over again. I don't want to die, and he says that he is watching the sunset and he's crying. I think it was in fact the night before he died. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, it does seem like somehow he did understand what he was doing and he knew how it was going to end. And I think you had mentioned at some point that you felt that the journal was um, that he was sort of aware as he was writing it that people would be reading it later yeah. as a document so there's that question of how you know if people are writing a journal in that way it sort of how authentic is it at that point you know like what do we how do we decide that yeah it's a good question i mean and he left his journal with the fisherman who'd taken him out there with instructions that they pass it back to his kind of support group back in the States. So yeah, this was definitely a document for posterity for John. And, and on the pages, he definitely didn't want to show any doubt. You know, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, John is not unique in a sense. There's a lot of these guys, missionary bros, who are pursuing that lonely path into the jungle to meet the uncontacted tribe. It's the story never varies. And, and very often they don't come back alive. You know, mm -hmm. John, John was hardly the first guy to do this. His, all, a lot of his heroes had done exactly the same thing and had also been killed. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, the story's mapped out for him. And, and um, there's no room in that story for doubt. You know, whether John had doubt in his own mind uh, about what he was, not just what he was doing, but, um, you know, proper doubt in faith. Was, was God going to save him at this point? I think of, he must have done right, but he doesn't say so. He, he holds fast to that. And, that. and that, I guess, is what I mean by immaturity in a way. I mean, it, it sounds unkind, but put it this way, you don't get old suicide bombers, right? They're all young men. You know, mm -hmm. after a certain point, you grow up and you think, eh, maybe this isn't so smart. You know, you're not so linear. You're not so monofocused. And John, I, he just didn't quite have the, as I say, the way I think of it is the maturity to, to accept the personal humiliation that will come with failing to perform his mission. And instead, he kind of had to go through with it. You wrote about this concept in the piece. Um... Can you talk to us just a little bit about it? It's this idea of Kalapani, which is like dark water, right? Yeah. Yeah, so Kalapani is, um, it's two things. It's, it's, uh, it's, the, it's a Hindu uh, uh, belief or kind of uh, curse in a way. The idea is it, it's the opposite of travel broadens the mind. The further away you get from India and particularly the Ganges, the more impure you're going to get. Uh, so it's a, it's a sort of, um, it's almost, a, it, it's making travels not quite forbidden, but, it, but it's, it's sort of saying travel putrefies the mind. It'll make you sinful. Kalapani is also the name that's been given to the jail. Uh, I mean, because the islands are, are two hours off India, it became associated with the islands and then it became associated with the jail that the Brits built where they housed all the freedom fighters because the Brits were so appalling that became 
a sort of center of sin and bad behavior. So it, it resonates on these islands. And, and I thought that was just a, such an interesting and useful concept for this story, because mm -hmm. it's the reverse of what we're told, right? We're told to go out in the world and experience it and, and um, educate ourselves. But what happened on these islands, as I say, was when foreign travelers arrived, is almost universally they pe they behave terribly, and 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 so that you know there's, there's a I, th I thought that was really useful as a as, as an idea to, to 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 kind of counter the idea of 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 travel as a good thing. You know, travel can be a terrible thing, as as you know, as my country proved. You know, more than any other. Uh, you know, we went around the world and and uh, messed it up. Another thing that's really that you kind of you return to that Kalapani in the end when you talk about this story of I may mispronounce but Anme or Enme and en Pandia yeah. Enme and Pandia and you talk about kind of piercing the veil of the dark water. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Well en Enme's story was was is mind blowing in so many ways. I mean this is a kid who fell out of a tree, as was first supposed, broke his leg, was treated. So he's from a Jarua tribe. He was whisked away by the Indian administration, taken to a hospital in Port Blair and kept there for six months. They fed him curry. Uh, they gave him Bollywood videos. The president of India came to visit. They showed him the modern world. Because the tribes and the, and the Indian settlers were antagonistic, there was, you know, poison arrows coming out of the jungle every now and then. The idea was, was to send this kid back into the tribe as a kind of Trojan horse. And, and he would say to everybody, do you know, the outside world is great. And, and, um, and that would sort of pacify them. And initially that's what happened. He went back after six months, immediately his tribe appeared on the road, started thumbing lifts into Port Blair. Everyone was told to let these guys walk around, take whatever they wanted. And, you know, the plan seemed to be working. And then the visits into town sort of petered out and stopped and no one could really work out what had happened. But, and this is where the story just gets absolutely fascinating. This anthropologist that I, I spoken to who, who, who knew Enmei, it took him years to find out what happened, but essentially Enmei hadn't broken his leg in the forest as he'd said. He'd been nearly killed by the father of a girl that he fancied. And the father didn't like him as a, as a potential suitor. So he, he'd broken his leg and thrown him out in the forest to die. When he went back to his tribe, kind of back from the dead, he was a celebrity. So he didn't marry the girl that he initially fancied. He married the prettiest girl in, in all the islands. <laughs> and the moment he sealed that deal, moved deep into the jungle and started a family. Stopped all the guiding all the trips into Port Blair. So, so the anthropologist is telling me this story and he's like, you know, I've been studying these guys for 20 years and it's all about the differences between us and then he goes, and how wrong could I have been? Look at this kid. He walks across a, a, a gap of 10,000 years, no problem at all. He deals with our world so well that actually he ends up manipulating all of us, including the president of India and his own tribe to get the top girl on the island. And once he achieves his own selfish aim, it ends, you know? I mean, and, and so he goes, it's not the differences between us, it's the similarities. And, and to me, that you know, for him, that was a, an epiphany. And for me too, because I'd been pursuing an interview with a Stone Age caveman. And here is a normal, complicated, selfish, ambitious schema making his way in the world um, in the same sort of messy fashion as the rest of us, he's a modern man. And, and I suddenly realized that I'd been, I, you know, pursuing a phantom. And, and actually, that's what John was doing as well. But I guess the difference between us was I, I, I got to realize that. Yeah. Tell us what you know, or what, and also what you think is probably true, but maybe may not completely know about his, um, his last day his last day or two well it's it's slightly speculation we know he had a kind of 27 point plan um and he was going to follow a rubric 
uh, laid out by many missionaries before when meeting uncontacted tribes, which was you kind of leave gifts on thoroughfares and pathways and pinch points and then retreat. And then if the gifts are taken, you come back and you leave more and you hope over a period of hours or most likely days or weeks to sort of gradually establish friendly contact. Then with the linguistics training that he had, he was going to try and pick up the language and slowly um, get to know uh, the tribe. And only probably five or 10 years down the line was he going to start bringing up Jesus and Christ and Christianity and so on. He was, you know, it was a one way trip for John and, you know, for him, he hoped that he was going to live, though, and 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 for him, it was going to be as long as it take. But this was a uh, a mission that was going to last a lifetime. And um, um, as I say, he, 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 that reflects his sort of meticulous planning, but it also reflects the fact that he was not the kind of colonial imposer that he was accused of being after his death. He was moving incredibly gently and very very slowly. Um, you know, he was, um, he was absolutely not trying to sort of push people around. Um, as I say, he had failed to take account of the fact that from the other side, from the Sentinelese, um, probably because they have experienced disease when they've met outsiders before, and also probably because outsiders have a history of kidnapping them for slavery, they kill people immediately. So he never got to do any of that. <laughs> I mean, there is, you know, that's the other side of it, right? I mean, these people did not want him to come. They could not be more clear that they don't want people to come. Um, there is a fear of, of disease, infection, you know. I well, mean, it, yeah. well, that's an interesting all of those criticisms are still there, right? I mean, that, right. you know. Well, okay, but here's the thing. We don't know what they want. We, is, you know, the fact that they've killed everybody who've landed on their island is taken as like, oh, well, that's their opinion that they don't, they don't want anybody to come, but actually is an opinion that's made in perfect ignorance a valid one, you know? I mean, if, if there was some way to communicate uh, to the Sentinelese um, the benefits of air conditioning or the internet or jet travel, I don't know if they had that information, whether they would make the same decision. The, you know, the point is we can't presume anything. So those that say we know what they wanted, like Survival International, absolutely not true. They're guessing. John was guessing that they'd want to be saved. Survival International is guessing that they want to be alone. But the truth is, we don't know. And probably there's not a uniform opinion. You know, you might have some elders sort of saying, oh, we want to keep things the same way the way they are. But you might have some young kids on the island going, I've seen a speedboat go past. I've seen an airplane go overhead. I'm curious. You know, I think the moment you start presuming, that's one of the lessons of this story. The moment you presume anything, you're heading down the wrong path. So one of the things the piece does really successfully, this is going to be probably um, one of my last questions because we're starting to get questions sort of coming in from uh, the audience. And if anyone else has a question, feel free to send it because we can just go through those um, one after the next in, in just a couple minutes. But one of the things that I found really interesting in the piece was just sort of setting up the mythology of missionaries in the missionary imagination. Um, and you told these amazing stories that were, to me, they were new. I hadn't, I wasn't aware of these people. Um, I think a lot of readers who are not from a background where missionary work is necessarily something that people do. I, I think they probably wouldn't know about them, but they're interesting. And they were in, they were kind of the background of John Allen Trout, right? I mean, you're talking about, I'm talking here about Jim Elliott and about um, Bruce Olson. Do you want to tell us about those guys and, and sort of how, yes, you know, well, how these, how this inspiration for these kinds of trips? Yeah, they're, I mean, they're, they're very different, but they're both, as you say, really interesting. So, so Jim Elliott was actually raised a few streets away from where John lived. Um, so he'd been to part of a group that went to Ecuador in, I think it was 1956, uh, in very similar circumstances, went to meet an uncontacted tribe, succeeded, even took one member of the tribe for a ride in their plane, 
and then was killed. And Jim Elliot ever since has been held up as this sort of perfect martyr um, in, in an almost kind of cartoonish way. Um, and his writing, his diary sort of poured over and interpreted. Um, there's a particular line in it, I forget, I forget exactly what it is, but it's taken as he knew that he was gonna die and he went anyway. Um, so, so he's like the, the paragon. Bruce Olsen came um, 15 years later, was another sort of big influence on John. What's interesting about Olsen, he did something very similar, uh, went to, flew to Venezuela, walked into the jungle, eventually got to an area on the border with Brazil, met a tribe and uh, converted them. He survived, although the tribe did it when they first meet him, try and kill him. Olsen was later exposed as a complete fabulist. The whole thing, um, uh, he, he, by people who sort of knew him at the time and, you know, in the jungle. And actually, if you read the book, it reads like fabulism. I mean, he talks about uh, grubs that are a foot long and, uh, you know, he says that the, the natives are fascinated by bright things. I mean, there's just too many cliches in there. Um, the point is, if you're in the, the missionary world, he's still a hero. They don't hear... They, they, well, it's not, as I say in the piece, it's not that they reject the criticism. They don't hear it. They don't hear it. They're deaf to it. Olsen, you know, is, is another paragon for them. And, and to me, I found that um, slightly terrifying. You know, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's um, you know, we, you and I, we spend our lives measuring versions and facts and trying to work out where the truth lies. Whereas... This is the opposite. This is coming in to the world, knowing the truth, and then mm -hmm. finding the facts to fit it. And, and um, th that was a real insight into John's mind, because as, to me, Bruce Olson's, you read his books, it's so obvious he's making it up. It's, you know, if I was an editor and I received that as copy, I'd be like, oh my God, you know. <laughs> there, you know, there, yeah, that, he was one of John's heroes. And, I, and in fact, I talked to another a kind of ex-missionary who'd lapsed, you know, he'd gone into the jungle in the Amazon again, had met an uncontacted tribe, and he lost his faith when he realized that the tribe was perfectly happy without God and perhaps had a better hold on spirituality and contentment than he did. Um, you know, so he had what I would call a kind of rational reaction, but he led me through that world and the missionary mindset, which is... is Fascinating. You talked too about the role of catastrophe in the missionary biography um, uh, and the right. fact that all of these stories seem to start with some kind of personal catastrophe, which I found interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, in the end, right, it's, it's we're dealing with human beings there and, and as much as they present themselves as high-minded and driven by principle or, or, or um, you know, a higher mission, as I say, John had that catastrophic break with his father. Um, and then a few months uh, before he went on his mission, he'd been, he'd been working as a mountain guide for six months of the year uh, in California. And a few months before he, he, he went, it was a giant wildfire and the hut where he'd lived burned down. You know, huge catastrophe. The whole part went up in flames. And a few days after that, um, the permission was lifted uh, in India for foreigners to go to North Sentinel Island. It was a kind of official cock up. They shouldn't have done it. They were trying, they, they, they meant to protect the tribes, but somehow the name of this island sort of slipped through. You know, and if you're John, it's not hard to see how you would have interpreted that. You know, your old life goes up in flames and boom, there's a new gateway opens, which directs you back to the mission you've always been on. But yeah, I mean, John's mentor, um, who turned up on the islands and, and gave him kind of last minute encouragement before he went, um, his father committed suicide. Um, um, the guy that I, I, I told you about who lost his faith in the jungle, he told me his mother had been an alcoholic and, yeah, and his father had left or something like that. He was saying personal catastrophe. They leave it out of the books, missionaries, but it's almost always there. There is... There's something other than faith 
that puts you on that faithful path. So interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go through some of these questions that people have for you. Um, so it's going to, we're going to start to jump around a little bit according to the questions. This is a simple question. The question is, would, the journal, was it on paper or was it online? Uh, the journal was written on paper. Uh, mm -hmm. The version I saw was scans of that. Okay. Um, there were, as I say, there was an Indian police version that had, um, that wasn't quite accurate. It was, you know, John's handwriting wasn't always intelligible. So I went back to the original to um, perfectly decipher his words. Um, and what was your closest point of contact with the tribe who killed him? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the question I get asked more than anything else. So did you go to the island? No, I didn't go to the island where the tribe kills every foreigner. <laughs> no. Um, I think I saw it on the horizon. Um, yeah. It's really quite close to um, Port Blair. Um, and once you see how close it is, you know, it took, John left the main island to get to North Central Island. It only took, I think, two and a half hours in a little fishing boat. Um, mm -hmm. Once you see that proximity, you realize how endangered this this tribe really is you know they're on a tiny island it's five miles by four miles and it is three hours sail from a city of 150,000 people in an archipelago that's been earmarked as, the, as kind of the new Thai islands so how long they get to last like that you know mm -hmm. I would say not you know it the future looks dim really uh, the other question about the tribe is there is linguistic their language, is it descended from an African language? Uh, I am not aware of that. I mean, nobody knows their language. Uh, we know some words from languages of neighboring tribes. Um, but as far as I know, uh, their isolation um, has been so lengthy that it's unique to those islands. Um, the, their DNA um, is what traces them back to Africa and as some of the migrants that, that, that first left Africa, you know. But, um, but the language, I think, is, is sufficiently evolved that it's unique. Um, interesting. I'm just looking at the question. So um, also, you're being asked whether John Allen Chua uh, was trying to uh, Cha, I don't know why I keep mispronouncing Cha, um, was trying to replicate the challenges his father faced in the Cultural Revolution and then at first in America. Interesting question. This gets into his father's background, which we haven't really gotten into yet. Right. I mean, so John's father, um, yes, was, was born in communist China. Um, was a musician and, and then and the, when Mao was in charge, was sent to work on a collective farm. His father wangled him away to Hong Kong where he was for two years. Then he found his way to California, learned English from the radio, went to ORU, Oral Roberts University, uh, studied medicine, became a doctor. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing immigrant success story. Um, but was John, Doing the same? I, I, I don't think so. I mean, for, for a number of reasons. One, um, as I say, he'd broken with his father. Two, Patrick converted to Christianity, but it was always a pragmatic decision. He went to ORU, which was a Christian university. So it was, in some ways, it was kind of the price of admission. But he never really took it into his heart. And in fact, since John's death, Patrick has completely reverted to Confucianism. Um, John was very pragmatic in his um, approach, but he was totally idealistic in his aims. And, and that was the big difference between them. Um, uh, Patrick was, was, as I say, the, the, the practical immigrant. John was the idealistic straight arrow. Got it. Um, I know Patricia wants to ask you something from the OPC, so I think she's gonna she's gonna hop in. 
Um, Alex, could you talk a little bit about um, projects you're working on now, the, the challenges of the life of a freelancer, and you were one of the recipients of one of our uh, freelance grants and how that is helping you. Yeah, um, sure. Um, I mean, I think like a lot of freelancers, when, when the coronavirus hit, um, you know, income just collapsed. Um, even for work that I'd uh, done and filed had been printed, uh, people turned around and said, well, we can't pay. Um, you know, I was suddenly $20,000 down. Um, and um, I am in the middle of researching two or three other stories. I'm attempting to work on another book. Uh, I'm working on a screenplay. But these are all really long-term projects. And uh, when you're doing, when you're living that kind of life, you know, cash flow becomes really <laughs> quite, quite an issue. And if there's one interruption to sort of regular payment or payment that you're counting on, it's a crisis. It's, it's, you know, suddenly your life is unsustainable. You know, I've got three daughters out there waiting for supper. You know, how am I going to put food on the table? Um, so the OPC money was just a, a complete lifeline. If I haven't said thank you, actually, I'm not, because this is the first time we've actually seen each other face to face. Absolute lifeline. Um, and um, it actually made me slightly ashamed of my own country that just doesn't have anything like it. Um, and so, um, yeah, thank you. But it, 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 it basically, it went towards, um, uh, sus yeah, just sustaining uh, uh, a career that otherwise I was, you know, looking at having to give up. Basically. Wonderful. And so I think that's it. Oh, no, that's not it. We have another question that came in now. Um, I don't know if you can also see the questions, Alex, or you want me to read this to you. Well, I guess oh, I yeah, the audience yeah. can see. It just says it, that the, the piece includes a lot of self reflection on your role as a journalist on a parallel path with John and on the pitfalls of this kind of reporting. How did reporting this piece change the way you approach your work and in particular reporting on indigenous communities? I mean, I guess over the years I've, I mean, losing my certainty about my profession uh, has been a, a sort of slow process. Um, and I've, I've funneled a lot of the doubts about it into this, piece I think mm -hmm. um, but I also I, I, you know the way that John had been pilloried around the world the more I read of that stuff and it, and it got to extraordinary proportions you know there were 4,000 reviews of, of the Andaman Islands online all jokes talking about uh, lovely islands but you know people kept firing arrows at me or you know my own leg was a little raw or whatever i mean the, the the level of cruelty and uh was unbelievable and i just having spoken to patrick and i communicated with his brother although he never sort of went on the record you could feel this family's pain and and how magnified that was by the way that john was treated after his death by people who didn't know him and didn't bother to understand him and didn't even bother to, 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 to even work out where the, where the Andaman Islands were. I mean, it, but the, the level of sort of malevolence and hatred was, it made me adamant that I was going to get my facts right. Uh, it made me really careful. I spent... Uh, months reporting this story, but I think we spent two or three months on the fact check, just making sure. Um, it, I really felt the weight of responsibility on this one. And I, yeah, and I, st I still carry that. I've, I've carried that on actually. You know. 
How about when it comes to reporting on indigenous communities? Has it changed your thinking about that? Well, I mean, you kind of wrote about that directly in the piece. Yeah. But I didn't know if you wanted to add anything beyond that. No, I mean, I'm not you pretty... maybe look at the works of others differently, or I don't know. I guess, I guess what the what I what I think about that is what I came to realize uh, working in Africa uh, for about for eight years, where it's, it's very hard to do a story where you don't have an aid group in it. I am that experience, and the piece reflects that. I'm very wary of foreigners talking for. Africans or indigenous tribes, you know, speaking up for someone, great. Speaking for them is very different. Mm -hmm. and, and that presumption that you know what somebody wants is, I think, very dangerous. And I think it's also very dangerous to find purpose in the lives of others because you, subs you subtract that purpose from their lives. You become the subject in their life. They become the object. And that sort of displacement, I think, is very dangerous. Um, so, yeah, that, that's very definitely reflected in the piece. Um, and as I say, the, the, the revelation to me that Enme was, was exactly the same as I was. You know, he's a selfish, ambitious schemer who wants to get married. You know, <laughs> uh, I, I, I get it. And, he, and he, wants the, he wants the best girl on the island. You know, it's, it's so human and it's it's um the the, the the romantic exoticism that 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 i had put around it you know it was it was a that, that to me was kind of a real epiphany uh in terms of yeah how to write about these these subjects yeah absolutely um one more question is it a book uh <laughs> <laughs> i i I don't know, is the answer. Um, there is a book being written by somebody else. Um, it could be, um, uh, it, I mean, I, I'm talking to people in, 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 in the US actually about um, uh, kind of limited uh, TV series. Um, I think there is more to say about this. Uh, there is, um, but I sometimes wonder about, I had 10,000 words. I was really pleased with how they turned out. I don't want to do something that's just padding. And I wonder whether the, where the other 60,000 words would come from. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe I should just knuckle down to it and, you know, but, um, and maybe I'm just too pleased with my own work, but I was really pleased with how the story kind of worked out. I felt, I, it felt like something that I'd been struggling to write for decades and, uh, and I, I kind of finally got there. It's a fantastic story. And if anyone has not read it, I, I really can't recommend it highly enough. It's, it's just, there's so much inside of that story. I feel like it's really rare to find a piece that has that many different themes and ideas and characters and even media because it kind of intersperses the journals and somehow it's all coherent and it all sort of plays together in the end into one sort of very, you know, very um, illuminating piece of work. And I, I think that I hope people read it. Um, it's just a great piece of work. And uh, thank you so much for speaking with us. I, I really enjoyed talking to you. I hope that um, everyone enjoyed hearing you. I'm sure they did. And thank you to you. And thanks to Patricia and the OPC. Well, likewise, uh, you know, thanks so much. I'm so glad you, you like the piece. Uh, as I say, it, it, it did mean a lot to me, but um, you know, there's no, no better thing to, for a writer here that another writer that liked it too. So thanks. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, thank you both so much. And it'll get new life when we'll, we'll post uh, a, a recap and links. And um, as I said, we often get a lot of attention afterwards too when there's a, on YouTube. So, okay. so thank you again. Thanks, Thanks so for much. having us, Patricia. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.